Hello, and welcome to episode two of Read, Return, Repeat, a Read ICT podcast. I'm your host, Sarah McNeil, adult programming librarian for the Wichita Public Library. In today's episode, we will explore category two, own voices. For those of you that aren't aware, own voices was a term coined in 2015 by Corrine Duvi on Twitter. Corrine used the hashtag own voices to promote diverse books written by diverse authors, highlighting the need for authenticity and inclusion. In today's episode, I will be speaking with local activist and literary champion Priska Barnes. Priska is the founder and CEO of Storytime Village, a children's literacy nonprofit. Priska has served as a leader in the community for many years and continues to bring awareness and advocacy to Wichita. Priska, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the show. Hi, Priska. It's good to see you. Hello. Thank you for having me today. Thank you. Um, Listeners, we're joined with Priska Barnes. As I mentioned in the intro, she has been a leader in the community for many years. She served on the Wichita uh, Library Board for a few years. She's also served for the, uh, is it the African American Museum of Kansas? Well, that was uh, many years ago. I was the yeah. executive director there. <laughs> right. There you are. So uh, she's had her hands in uh, lots of different organizations to promote diversity and inclusion in Wichita. Priska, I've got a few questions for you today. And so we'll just jump right in and start with question one. OK, sure. So the name Priska Barnes is synonymous with reading here in Wichita. Who or what helped you develop your love of reading? Well, um, my parents gave me that foundation. Um, we had our own home library, and before there was Google, uh, we had those lovely encyclopedias and all sorts of books that we could go to um, in our home to research and to learn more about the world. Um, but um, my mother, who is a retired uh, kindergarten teacher, uh, she was adamant about those bedtime stories, mm-hmm. and uh, we we had bedtime stories every night before she tucked us into bed. Um, And then because she was a a teacher, our summers were filled with really great moments at the library. We would go to the public library and spend hours there and we would check out every type of book that we could imagine, even cookbooks and come back and explore at home and making those recipes. So I had a really rich, um, uh, you know, uh, literacy uh, environment, you know, is encouraged in the home. And, um, and that's what fuels me today. Definitely. I remember as a child, um, doing the summer reading program and the book it program, right? Where you got your free personal pan book pizza. It kid. Yes, yes. I I didn't go to recess a lot because I got pizzas and would stay in. For, <laughs> I have to to work out a lot now. Now, but but I really enjoyed that program. I I mean I love book it. That, I, I'm a proud book it kid. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I think I have a Pizza Hut obsession because of Bucket. <laughs> so, as I mentioned in our introduction uh, to this episode, it's based on the genre called Own Voices. Now, mm-hmm. did you have any titles that were diverse by diverse authors when you grew up, as a child, a teenager, or even through your adulthood? Um, and if so, could you uh, share those with our listeners today? So, you know, I I even um, asked my mother, I was going back through, you know, memories about, you know, the types of books that we were reading when I was a child. And I could not remember, that's why I had to ask my mom, I could not remember a lot of titles that had diverse um, characters. And so I asked my mom and she said, I, and, and you know, she was a kindergarten teacher as well. She did not have a lot, nor had access to a lot of diverse um, uh, children's books. Um, she did, however, um, there were uh, Ezra J- Jack Keats, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, The Snowy Day and, and it, books like that. She did her best to find um, books like that, that where you could see yourself, but we didn't have have that. Um, it wasn't until um, my, uh, so I have 
uh, older brothers that went to college before me. And, and then we all uh, went to um, HBCUs, historically black colleges. And we learned so much about our heritage and our culture. And that's when we were exposed to, you know, beautiful books like Mafaro's Beautiful Daughters and, and books like that, that, um, you know, were fairy tales and not just, uh, it, you know, books that talked about history. Um, so, you you know, you can find books about Harriet Tubman and things like that, but were there books um, that were the fairy tale books? And so those, um, and those folk tales. And, mm-hmm. and so uh, it, that was when I began to, it was in my late teens, um, you know, young adulthood, when I started to discover more, um, you know, culturally diverse books, books that um, you know, that I wanted to share with others because they, I, I could, they resonated with me. Definitely. So I, um, I come from a multicultural background. My father's from Iran. I can't remember anything until college. Uh, yeah. I had a, I had a, a white friend who suggested Marjam Satrapi's graphic novel Persepolis. Mm-hmm. And I have a kind of a distant relationship with my dad. So I didn't, necessarily grow up in the culture, the Persian culture, like 24 seven, it was more of a, uh, on the summers or, or breaks. So I did get exposure to it, but i never saw it in literature. And then it was slightly awkward to have this friend know more about my heritage than I did in college and, and share it with me. And I tried not to resent her for it because I was like, she's opening this up to me. She's making this accessible. Um, but I felt kind of like, oh, that, that hurts a little that like yeah. this woman found this book in a women's studies class and I didn't, I didn't have that connection. Um, so that led me on a quest to start discovering more books that were like that. But unfortunately, a lot of uh, authors that are uh, Persian are um, suppressed in what they can share unless they're mm-hmm. outside of Iran. So uh, it it's difficult to find that. And I grew up in a college town in Oklahoma, so it was liberal in that sense, but the things that we were learning about were not um, in terms of diversity. Um, so that mm. was hard. That was that was hard for me and my sister to kind of like see ourselves because we were kind Which of struggling. Which is so important. That's yeah. very important. Yeah. Representation. I, I, I felt almost embarrassed about my Persian heritage because there wow. was nothing for me to connect with. Um, mm-hmm. So I wouldn't, unless someone said my last name, I wouldn't identify as being uh, oh, wow. biracial. And I kind of, because of my complexion and I couldn't pass as a, you know, 100% white person. So mm-hmm. I did for a, a really long time. Um, all right. Well, I won't get into all that, but, and later in life, it helped me to like discover diversity and to seek that. Um, so you're a leader in the community. We've mentioned that, um, who are and what gave you the foundation for leadership? Because that is so important when you're trying to emulate that to youth and, um, spark that engagement. Um, and how does that reflect in the organizations that you belong to? I take it back to my parents. Um, so I'm I'm the daughter of a pastor, and it it was a that, that whole sense of servant leadership was it was you know in, embedded in in all of us as children. Um, you know, we we would sing a song. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, you have to learn to be a servant of all. And so um, that uh, you know, understanding that leadership is not just being in the front. It's not just right, having right. a title. Um, it is, uh, you know, doing the work that, that um, is, is guiding people to, you know, a goal and to, um, you know, and so, um, you know, because, uh, you know, I had that uh, upbringing and, and that uh, you know, that was a principle that was taught. Um, you know, I serve in a lot of organizations. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, it, sometimes 
you know, it, it kind of can be a little overwhelming because when you when you when you serve a lot and it, it, it pulls at you, it takes a lot from you. Um, but it is uh truly worth it in the end, I do believe. But uh, I think that's what pushed me to start the nonprofit. I uh, um, I saw that there was a, a, a need, a challenge after, you know, um, uh, publishing the children's book. Um, I saw that there was a, a need because I, you know, started to research and see where, you know, the, the uh, disparities. And, you know, I... I it, I truly wholeheartedly believe that, you know, if I know that there is a problem and I don't do anything to try to solve it, you know, that that um, I couldn't sleep at night (laughs) knowing that I, you know, you know, I could be. working or doing something in the realm of literacy, but I'm not focusing on the issues that are, um, you know, um, a part of the, um, you know, that are, that are challenging our community. Um, I had to uh, start uh, the nonprofit so that I could, um, you know, make that difference. And, and, and that just goes right back to, you know, what I learned as a child, you know, doing that, that being that servant, being that, um, um, you know, having that community mindset, and then that led to leading in, in, I guess, this, the field that I'm in, but it was not setting out to say, I'm going to be a leader. (laughs) I'm going to, I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand out. Um, um, uh, but, but I believe those principles, I guess, lead to, um, leadership and, and, um, making you stand out, uh, um, even sometimes when you don't really want to. Yeah, definitely. We, when our parents or, or the caregivers or the people that are in our community model something for us and we see them being successful with that, it makes us want to achieve mm-hmm. that, um, that too, or help spread that, promote that. Um, so you did mention that you've written a book and that that spurred, um, reflections for you to create a nonprofit. If I were to jump uh, into my library time machine and travel back to 2005, when you wrote that book, what was the catalyst for you and your brother to write a children's book? Uh, This is going to be a broken record. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say my parents this time, but I'm going to say family. Um, And I come from a really big family. So my mom is the second oldest of 10 children. And then my dad is one of six brothers and then they had a sister. So I have this huge family. Um, And um, on my mother's side, we always gather for uh, Christmas and uh, other holidays. But for Christmas, um, growing up, we would always exchange gifts and we, uh, as young people, th- you know, we didn't, you know, we weren't going to go out and buy gifts for everyone. What could we give? And my brother and I decided we were going to write a children's book and give that to our cousins as a gift for Christmas. And, um, well, I <laughs> I was in college at the time. <laughs> and, and I really, I, and, and I'm a perfectionist, too. So that Christmas gift never happened. <laughs> <laughs> Better late than never. <laughs> but it, but it really, um, you know, my brother, being the persistent brother he is, he never let that die. He, he, I mean, the entire time I was in college, he was like, We're, "When are you going to be finished? When are you going to finish? We're going to finish this book." And after I graduated. Because I took my own, you know, time and pace. Um, after I graduated, we we actually finished the book and we published uh, in two thousand and five. That was two years after I graduated. <laughs> but <That's okay. laughs> but but we got it done, and then that's when um, you know it, it it spurred. You know, it it it, it by creating the book by um, publishing the book, um, it opened up so many of your, uh, thoughts and, and, uh, and that's when the research began after, um, publishing the children's book. 
That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, that's such an endearing story. I have a sibling that's similar to your brother who is always encouraging me to write uh, whatever story comes up. I have a 10 year old and she's like, you need to write your birth story. You need to do it before you forget. And it's like, she's 10 and I still haven't written it because whatever. But yeah, no, I understand that. Well, I'm so glad that you did start off with that first book. Um, Definitely. I'm glad to, I'm glad he pushed me. I really, <clears throat> I, I wasn't um, that excited about it and he had to push and keep pushing, but I'm glad he did. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking about the advantages and challenges of creating an own voices book. Are you struggling to find your next great read? Have you already watched Netflix's entire catalog? We have just the thing to get you out of your reading or viewing rut personalized reading and viewing lists. We'll have you fill out a quick form so we can get to know your reading and viewing preferences. And then our librarians will find titles that fit your interests. Go to wichitalibrary.org forward slash recommendations to get started. Welcome back to the show. We're here with Priska Barnes, and we've been talking about the genre own voices and how Priska used her own voice to expand the scope of diversity in children's literature. Um, while the movement to tag books as own voices has brought attention to diverse authors, it has come with a double-edged sword, also limiting authors of color mm -hmm. because their works are scrutinized greater for authenticity or maybe rejected for minor fictional fabrications like setting and tone. Have you seen this double standard when you compare your books to retellings of fables or origin stories written by white authors? So let's first, you know, kind of talk about double standards here. Uh, so, you know, I, the the challenge that I see, you know, just um, you know, growing up uh, a, a black woman and knowing that there are, uh, you know, so many, um, you know, it, it, it's a conversation that we have within the community about how much harder you have to work uh, to prove yourself, to to um, to be um, you know validated, and to say that you know um, you know your worth, uh, um, you know being recognized for uh, you know uh, you know in any field, not just um, you know the literary arts, um, but it, you know that that is something that has that's that's a challenge for um, you know people of color. Um, everywhere trying to to prove themselves and so when we look at um you know literature and we look at a lot of even the books that have um you know people of color in the books sometimes when you look at the author it the author is is not even you know a person of color um and so um uh, for that, you know, for that to be the, you know, if that is the case and, and, and we're listening to someone else tell our own story, you know, uh, and then and then on the other hand, you're accusing a person of color who is telling their story and, and of not being authentic. <laughs> I think that I don't think that's a fair um, I don't think that, you know, the fair judgment. Um, um, and so I, I think really um, we need to learn more about um, culture, our, you know, different cultures and how we tell stories. Um, you know, when you look at, you know, um, you know, folk tales and things of that nature, um, they're not going to be, you know, factual in, in every way, um, they will lead you to a fact, but it is the expression of the culture that's telling that story and they tell it in a colorful way, in a way that expresses who they are as a people. Um, and for someone to make a judgment to say, you know, um, uh, you know, this is not a, you know, this shouldn't be on the shelves because it, you know, it is, uh, it's not factual or it, or you, you, you've, um, you know, um, taken the liberty to, to be, 
um, more expressive than we believe you should. Uh, that challenges me. That is something that is, um, uh, that, that you know, something that we should really be concerned about and um, and fight for and, and say, you know, we want to hear stories from people in their own voices and we want to hear them in the way that they would express themselves within their own communities. Definitely. Yeah. Two um, picture books come to mind. Um, Tommy DePaola, who recently passed away, he did the Streganona series, but he also did retellings of Native American stories. And one that I absolutely love is The Legend of the Blue Bonnet. And it's about this story of this little girl who basically sacrifices her only worldly possession to save her community. So it's a beautiful story. And it's, I mean, just makes me tear up every time I read it, but it does feel awkward that he's retelling the story and that even though he's creating a wider audience, it may not be as authentic as it could be. Or the Raven, um, which recently the Wichita Art Museum had the Raven exhibit. And so that was someone from that community creating art to tell that origin story. And you know, obviously origin stories go through different phases where they can be reinterpreted or they're slightly different, but it does make a bigger impact, I feel, if it's someone from that community telling that story because they have history there. Yeah. It's um, So yeah, I know it, it, it's just hard, you know, we want, we want diverse voices. We want to have people um, sharing those, but we also kind of crave authenticity because otherwise, you know, I can write a story about anyone and then, yeah, it doesn't, it's not as impactful, but yeah. okay. Well, so you have now authored and co-authored three children's books. For many aspiring authors, publishing a book can be a daunting endeavor. Uh, what challenges did you face and what route did you take to get your books in the hands of children and their caregivers? Our path to publishing our first children's book was through a self-publishing avenue. And I really um, respect the self-publishing world right now and the, the direction that, um, you know, authors are going in today, taking, um, you know, the, you know, the literary world by storm, by publishing their own books th themselves and not waiting on that long daunting process. And, you know, and, and, you know, especially, you know, we've been talking about, you know, the, the challenges that people of color have it, it, that whole journey, trying to get in the door and, and someone, you know, validating you and all of that. Well, you don't have to go through all of that when you self-publish. Um, and so we um, we self-published our first book, my brother and I, um, and then that just completely, um, you know, inspired me even through the work that I do with Storytime Village. Um, we're in the process right now of, um, you know, opening doors for other um, writers and illustrators to create their own books through what we call the Children's Book Institute. And so we're pairing authors and writers together and um, giving them an avenue that will provide them with, you know, the um, critique that they need, you know, for, you know, the writing um, and then, you know, putting artists together so that it, we, we have a, a greater opportunity to get your book published and it's still supporting, you know, the, the, um, the mission of Storytime Village, which is that, that um, you know, zero to eight demographic. So we, um, I'm really excited about that. And I'm really excited about uh, uh, the world of self-publishing. And, and so that's, that's how we got started. And, and I want to um, help others to continue um, and learn more about self-publishing. Yeah, that's great. So right now the library has this initiative where um, we partnered with a short story edition. Um, there are these little kiosk machines yeah. that you can 
write a short story, submit it on our website, and then we have staff that review it. And then there's three locations around town where you can uh, have your story printed off. So me and my daughter, we did that the other day. Uh, she so showed fun. me, yeah, she showed me this poem, and I was like, oh my god, this is amazing! Like I'm inspired by what you wrote. Let's put this on the short story edition. And um, and then I had shared a story that I wrote, or I had actually kind of created this uh, campfire story for her when she was four, and it was just something that we just kept uh, re. Uh, revisiting. And so I was like, well, why don't I? I've never, like, I'm not going to publish, but this might be nice to get this story out in the community. And then if someone wants to tell that to their child, they can. Um, So that was a really great uh, opportunity for both of us to explore writing together. And I mean, it's obviously it's not self-publishing, but it's getting your words out. Yes. yes. It kind of like a teaser. So wonderful. I love that. Um, in December, the New York Times published an article titled Just How White is the Book Industry? Describing the economic disparity between authors of color and white authors who are published by larger publishing houses. The article implied that there is a systematic problem within the industry. And in 2019, there was a movement on social media where authors would use the hashtag publishing paid me and disclose what they were being offered for book deals with tactically uh, to bring awareness to the issue. What can our listeners do to support diverse authors in our own community? Well, that article um, uh, was, you know, I had, I had recently uh, read an article that talked about children's books um, and representation in children's books. Um, and um, um, and it, it went on to talk about reading motivation and how critical reading motivation is um, uh, to uh, support, you know, reading uh, achievement and when you don't see yourself represented then you don't have that same um, motivation to read and so you know what we could do as a community um, is um, uh, ensure that there are um, books that have people of color represented in those books um, uh, read those books to your children they you don't have to um, uh, and, and I think what it, what it, what we, we should do is ensure that it's not just an uncommon, like when you go, uh, to the library and get a book, maybe get a book that doesn't necessarily look like you. So that when you are reading that to a child, um, they have a hunger for diverse books as well. And then also help to ensure that children of color have books that look like them um, so that um, they have that reading motivation. We have a real big challenge um, right now in our state with uh, the literacy rate. There's 85% of African-American fourth graders that are below proficient in reading. And um, one of the things that we can do is to ensure that these children are motivated to read and if we provide them with books that that resonate with them, you know, they can see themselves in it. Um, I think we can see some change happen and we can see, um, uh, you know, uh, a shift happening with that big statistic. Um, but then also when you when you also have these diverse books available to um, all children, then you're creating this this, you know, a a community of um, acceptance and, um, and, and, and and knowing, you know, that we should all, uh, our, all of our voices should be heard. And, and so it, you're grooming and creating a community that is, um, you know, has a, a, a greater love and acceptance for everyone. So I think that's one of the things that we can do is just really look at, um, you know, the, look at the books that we're consuming maybe add some different um, titles um, and search out, search out books, um, you know, with with uh, diverse characters uh, and ensure that they get in the hands of um, the children that need them most. 
Yeah. And for our listeners that need help with that, they can, um, the library offers services where you can uh, have recommendations uh, from the different librarians. So children's librarians, our teen service librarian, even our adult librarians can uh, compile lists and make reading recommendations. So, so awesome. it doesn't have to be a daunting task. You, I mean, yeah. you can obviously get on the internet and see what's out there, but if you, you know, you can trust your local librarians to, to help you make those uh, yes. connections as well. <laughs> Well, we're going to take another quick break. Uh, When we come back, we'll be talking about the need for creating a children's literacy initiative in Wichita with local children's author and illustrator, Priska Barnes. Have you heard about our short story dispensers? We have three in Wichita for you to enjoy. One at Reverie Roasters, Hunter Health Clinic, and Abla Library at Wichita State. The dispensers print out a short story for you to enjoy. And now you can submit your own for consideration in the collection. Find out more at our website, wichitalibrary.org. Welcome back to the show. We're here with Priska Barnes, and we've been talking about the challenges that authors encounter when publishing a book. How did creating or co-creating a book transfer to starting a nonprofit to help underserved children in Kansas? We touched a little bit on this earlier, but could you give our listeners a little bit more context? Sure. So um, it was after publishing um, the children's book, The Magic Tooth, <laughs> with my brother. Um, uh, we we started out with, um, you know, book signings and things of that nature. But then, um, you know, it was that was that was nice and, and that was fun. But, um, you know, it there was a hunger for more. And and then I started to do the research. And when, when you start to research, um, you're, you're going to uncover some things that you may, um, you know, be surprised at. And I was very surprised, uh, by the, you know, the disparities in, in, um, you know, our state, you know, what was going on with, um, our literacy rates, um, and I stated earlier, you know, there um, are 85 percent of African American fourth graders below proficient in reading, and that statistic has not changed much over a, you know, a decade. And so, um, you know, at the time, um, I knew nothing about, you know, starting a nonprofit. Um, I, but I knew I needed to do something, and so I started hosting events and um and then um eventually uh, incorporated um and then um finally got you know the 501c3 um nonprofit status but it was a complete growing process a, a lot of a lot of learning and a lot of uh, you know life happenings. <laughs> uh, I won't bore you with the long journey because there is a lot that happened. There's a, there's a, there's a book to be written about what happened all the way, you know, to that point. But, but the, the, the whole, um, you know, to get to the, the core of it was, you know, the, the, the book opened up my heart and my mind, uh, publishing that book, um, uh, you know, opened up, uh, this, this this new um an opportunity to do what I've been you know groomed as a child to do with to serve at a greater level um and to see how I could make a difference in um you know changing the you know this or or being a part of the solution for this big issue that I saw um you know facing our children um and I just could not just have a children's book and not do something to impact, um, you know, children that were, you know, struggling. So that's that's how the book was the beginning of a nonprofit. <laughs> that's great. So you had touched a little bit on like the mentorship that you have with your organization, uh, with authors and children, uh, illustrators. Uh, you also have a reading camp called Leap. Uh, which helps promote diverse books by diverse authors. Can you tell our listeners about the program and the impacts that it's had on the participants involved? 
Oh my gosh, that camp is so much fun. So the, uh, you know, the, the camp is what I call a boot camp for uh, <laughs> young writers. <laughs> and um, we, you know, we have, uh, we open up our, our uh, camp to, uh, we, we do a lot of our um, recruitment at a lot of the um, uh uh, Title One schools um, in the in the community, and so we are we're we're looking for the hungry young um, uh, uh, excited writers to join us um, in this four week camp where they learn how to write, illustrate, and publish and sell <laughs> their own books. So That's they, important. <laughs> they, so they, you know, they go through the process of, of, you know, all of the, we have a curriculum that teaches them how, you know, uh, how to write their book. And then we use the illustration in, even in that process of the storytelling. So, you know, we want them to be able to express themselves through the illustrations. Um, and then, and then we uh, we work with Mennonite Press, which is uh, you know an area uh, printing company, and uh, we have a big book signing, and they invite their families and friends to come, and we uh, celebrate them, and and they are what we call our, the youngest um, you know <clears throat> authors in our community uh, and and we, we 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 make a big deal out of it because we want them um, to understand the importance of telling your own story um, we want them to understand uh, that you know we, we were talking earlier about you know uh, that article um, in the New York Times and they were talking about how Authors are not always paid properly and all of that. Well, you know, we're not giving them a, you know, a salary or anything of that nature, but we want them to know their worth. And so they, you know, receive the proceeds from their book sales, um, you know, and, and, you know, so they are, um, you know, empowered by um, creating um, this, you know, uh, this work of art, and then they um, are um, uh, encouraged by the opportunity to, uh, you know, make a little make a little money on, uh, you know, from from uh, the sale of their book. And so that's the carrot at the end to get them to go through the process uh, and go through the process in such a quick fashion. But they learn so much, and they um, I'm I'm so impressed every year with um, the young people that go through the program and come out with, um, uh, you know, such growth. Um, you know, they start out, um, you know, may, they may not know uh, a lot about what we're going to share with them, but they come out um, even better readers because they go through, uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of uh, training, even when it comes to, to reading, um, and they come out better writers. Um, they come out with a better sense of self. And, um, you know, so it really is exciting to see um, in that short amount of time, how much growth uh, happens with those young people. Definitely. That's so valuable to like validate these children and their voices and then encourage them in, in the summertime when there's this reading slump or when people don't necessarily want to be engaged mentally like that children especially you keep forcing them to you know cultivate that and then they that I'm sure that carries on in the fall when they go back to school it's like they're ready to go they're ready oh, yeah. to, um, they're energized yeah, we've had um, a, a parent come back to us and uh, uh, his daughter was in our program and she was a struggling reader. And when she went back into the classroom, they were amazed that, um, you know, she was reading, you know, above level <laughs> um, and really had impressed her teacher. Um, you know, they and, you know, this father was really um, excited because he was before the program was really, um, you know, um, 
you know, challenged or, you know, really, uh, you know, not he he wanted his daughter to be able to read better and he didn't have the tools to be able to help her. And um, and so when he got the report from her teacher that she was doing better and that, you know, the summer was not a wasted summer. She had that, you know, experience and then came out, um, you know, a, a better reader. We we were very proud of her for that and um, uh, excited that she's going to, you know, uh, grow in her ed- in her educational achievement. Definitely. Um, I briefly touched on this on our first episode, but uh, I struggled with reading at about third grade and. I think that like you're saying, when you're motivated, you're on it. Um, Mm -hmm. And if you're empowered, you'll Mm -hmm. do it. And Mm -hmm. sometimes it, it isn't, the burden falls on the parents, obviously, but sometimes it's not the parents that are the ones to inspire the child. Sometimes Mm. it's their peers or Mm -hmm. opportunities like this camp that can give the child um, an outlet that they may not have in a normal setting. So Mm -hmm. Well done. Well, thank you. (laughs) So in addition to being an author and CEO of Storytime Village, you belong to the Speakers Bureau of Humanities Kansas. How did you secure that role? And how did that lead you to write your latest book, a nonfiction children's book titled People, Pride, and Promise, The Story of the Dockham Sit-In? My I, I, I'm always stumbling on things, <laughs> you know, there things are just uh, uh, happening. Well, I started out um, as the youth advisor uh, for uh, the NAACP, which is the um, the same youth council that conducted the Dockham sit-in in 1958. And so serving in that capacity, I, I was uh, working with young people, they would come into the program, and I was shocked that they knew nothing about the Dockham sit-in. And like, you are about to be a part of this historic youth council, and you don't know about the Dockham sit-in. And then it wasn't just those young people. I don't, you know, you talk to young people throughout the community, many, you know, or probably not many at all know much. And then when you talk to adults, then a lot of people, you know, are not that informed. And so, um, you know, I, I said, well, what can I do? Always trying to find a solution here to, um, you know, not only impact the young people in the youth council, but to educate a wider community. And I, uh, worked with Humanities Kansas to create a project. It was the People, Pride, and Promise project that um, uh, had a documentary. So we had a documentary that we uh, created that could reach a younger demographic. And we even included young people in the creation of it. And so they were a part of the the documentary itself. Um, and then we um, created a traveling exhibition that traveled to libraries throughout the state. We were uh, in the Wichita Public Library mm-hmm. um, and, and, and other libraries throughout all the way to Kansas City and beyond. Um, but uh, So we had the exhibition. And then the last part of the um, project was the children's book. And the the reason for creating the children's book was how do we, you know, if we can get this into the hands of our, you know, of, of readers, young readers, then they'll know the story. They'll be able to share the story. We can keep passing it on and keep passing it on. Um, and so that it was to me, a, an immersive experience of, you know, you have the, the um, exhibit, you can walk through it. You have the mm-hmm. documentary gives you a little bit more insight into it. And then you have the book that you can read over and over again. And it helps you to, you know, to, to share the story. Um, and so in the midst of that, then um, the Speakers Bureau opportunity presented itself to even expand the project further. And so I have been traveling. Every, I was just, I actually just, was in um oh goodness now I'm now I'm forgetting the little small town I was in it'll come to me but I've I've been 
to so many small towns in Kansas and sharing the story of the Dockham sit-in. And it's amazing. I mean, I love, you know, we're I'm, I'm mostly in libraries and, mm-hmm. um, you know, sitting and talking with people. And I give my presentation, but then I open the floor up for dialogue. And, oh, my goodness, we have some great dialogue. Um, but that Speakers Bureau is an extension. Uh, um, that Speakers Bureau um, uh or me being on the Speakers Bureau is an extension of the project and just to con- have an opportunity to continue um, spreading the um, awareness about the Dockham sit-in. And we're, we, if we keep at this pace, we're going to cover all of Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> I recently checked out the, uh, the documentary and watched it with my daughter and she was just like, I can't even conceptualize like that being a reality. And my husband grew up in Derby and he had never heard of it. Um, Mm. Back when I used to work at the Angelo branch, we had um, Miss Jean at Cancel Burton. She had come and done a story time and she read the story of Ruby Bridges and my daughter's name was Ruby. So that was like so impactful for her to hear about this other little girl named Ruby and the you know, the obstacles that she faced just to go to school. And so I'm trying to like, not strategically introduce these themes to her, but I want them to be present so she can, um, she she can see that there's been a struggle and it wasn't that long ago that, you know, folks here in Wichita didn't have the same uh, amenities or rights. And, you know, we just have to keep fighting for those. We can't become complacent. Well, Um, I want to thank Prisca. That concludes our questions and interview for this uh, portion of the episode. Thank you, Prisca, for making time to join us today. Thank you for having me. Today, we're joined by three librarians who will share their recommendations for noteworthy books that fit Category 2 Own Voices. My name is Jenny Durham, and I'm a library assistant in the adult programming department here at the Advanced Learning Library. My recommendation for an Own Voices title is Cemetery Boys by Aidan Thomas. In this young adult novel, Yadriel, a Latinx transgender male, yearns for his very traditional family to accept his true gender. That is, his family of brujas and brujos, which in English roughly translates to witch, although that is an oversimplification. In this story, Yadriel's family worships Santa Muerte, or Lady Death, and in return for this veneration, are blessed with magical abilities, particularly those pertaining to the realm of the dead, such as helping spirits cross over and healing the sick. When his family continues to refuse to allow him to take part in the annual coming-of-age ceremony, where he would officially be recognized as a brujo, Yadriel, with the help of his best friend Maritza, performed the ritual in secret and accidentally summoned the ghost of Julian, one of the resident bad boys at his school. Unfortunately, Yadriel can't get rid of him unless he agrees to help Julian solve the mystery of who murdered him. Although initially Julian's constant chatter annoys the more reserved Yadriel, The more time they spend together, the less Yadriel wants him to leave, and the more he starts to learn about being true to yourself. I listened to this on audiobook, and if you haven't tried audiobooks before, this would be an excellent one to start with. This was such a heartwarming story, rich with a blend of Latin American folklore, including Mexican, Cuban, and Colombian traditions. What I particularly loved about the audiobook was how much personality the narrator, Avi Roque, infuses into the story. In addition, the narrator is also a trans Latinx male, and I think it's incredibly important that a story like this have this level of representation, especially by someone who could bring so much authenticity to Yadriel's character rather than making a stereotype of him. At the end of the audiobook, there's an interview between the author and narrator that I really enjoyed. In the interview, they talk about how many of the experiences of Yadriel reflect their own experiences of being Latinx, transgender, and queer, and how it is important for there to be books like these to reflect the unique challenges 
of being LGBTQ plus within the more traditional aspects of many Latin American cultures. If you're looking for a heartwarming, funny, and magical book, check out this own voices title, Cemetery Boys by Aidan Thomas. My name is Sean Jones, Communications Specialist for the Wichita Public Library. My recommendation for Read ICT Category 2, an own voices book, is The Kite Runner by Khalid Hosseini. I first read this book as a sophomore in high school, and it was the first book that left me emotionally distraught. I haven't gone back to it yet, but I want to. The Kite Runner was published in 2003 and tells the gripping story of two boys in war-torn Afghanistan who form an unlikely friendship. One is the son of a wealthy merchant, and the other is the son of their servant. They bond over flying kites, and one of the boys is an expert kite runner. He always knows where the kite will land. After a horrific event tears their friendship apart, We are taken years into the future where an opportunity for solace and redemption is at stake. Secrets abound. Relationships are threatened. It's a story about friendship, fathers and sons, brotherhood, and telling the truth amidst potential fallout. Hi, I'm Daniel P. Wardy. I'm an adult programming librarian, and today I'm here to talk to you about Heartbeat of Wounded Knee by David Troyer. Native American culture is often thought of in the past tense, beginning with the first European contact in 1492 and ending with the end of the Indian Wars and the forced removal to reservations in the late 1800s. However, there are over 5 million Natives and First Nation people alive today in the U.S. and Canada, and their history continues. The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee by Ojibwe author David Troyer examines that history. The book, which Troyer began writing in 2018, examines contemporary Native history starting in 1890 until present day. Using historical documents, interviews, memoirs, and the author's own indigenous perspective, this book creates a well-researched and compassionate narrative of Native people from the last 128 years. I really enjoy this book because as a Native American myself, it's really refreshing to see our history told from our own perspective. Oftentimes, books on Native Americans are written by non-Native authors, and because of this, they lose a lot of the nuance that comes with writing about people from an outside perspective. Hearing Natives tell their own history is just as refreshing as it is empowering and lends towards accuracy by including another narrative to the story of North America. Another issue with Native history books is that they will focus too much on events pre-1890 before Natives were relocated to reservations. And it's refreshing to see that Native Americans still continue their culture and traditions well into the 21st century. Thank you for those awesome recommendations. And thank you to the listeners of today's episode. Listeners can request books by visiting our website, wichitalibrary.org, or calling the library at 316-261-8500. To participate in the Read ICT Reading Challenge, please visit wichitalibrary.org slash readict. Staff curated lists are available for each category. You will also find instructions on how to register and log books on the Beanstack app, which allows you to track your books throughout the year and automatically enters participants into monthly prize drawings. And as always, stay connected with other Read ICT participants on the Read ICT Challenge Facebook page. Find out what's trending near you, post book reviews, look for local and virtual events, and share book humor with like-minded folks. You can follow this podcast through the Anchor app or stream episodes on popular channels like Spotify, Apple Podcast, or Google Podcast. If you like what you heard today, be sure to leave us a five-star review. This has been a production of the Wichita Public Library, and a big thanks goes out to those staff members who helped produce this episode. I'm your host, Sarah McNeil. Join us next time when we will be discussing Category 3, Animals and Pets, with local naturalists and exhibit caretaker for the Kansas Wildlife Exhibit in Wichita's Central Riverside Park.